When people go to the polls two weeks from now, they won't just be voting for candidates. In some states, they'll be passing judgment on social issues. In Oregon, Washington, and the Rocky Mountain state of Colorado, it's the legalization of marijuana. Part of this has to do with cash-starved governments looking for new things to tax for more revenue. But much of it has to do with a growing acceptance, or at least tolerance, for a drug that was once considered the devil's weed and a flashpoint for cultural and generational warfare. Seventeen states have now legalized its medical use for the treatment of things like glaucoma, the effects of chemotherapy, and chronic pain, defying federal laws that still consider marijuana more dangerous than cocaine and methamphetamine. If you want to know what legalized marijuana might look like, the place to go is Colorado, which has the most developed medical marijuana industry in the country. The story will continue in a moment. In Denver, if you want to find a medical marijuana dispensary, just look for the Green Cross. You won't have to go far. There are 204 of them in the Mile High City. That's roughly three times the number of Starbucks and McDonald's combined. They come in all sizes and shapes. There is the health food store motif in 70s style head shops. There are storefronts pitching low cost weed and boutiques offering gourmet ganja. No stems and seeds here, just walnut sized buds freshly harvested from the cultivation room out back. When patients arrive, this is where they'll have to show their patient registry card and their driver's license to gain access to mm -hmm. the actual marijuana center itself. You could smell it. <laughs> this is all private enterprise, licensed, regulated, and taxed by the state. It was enshrined in the Colorado Constitution after voters approved an amendment allowing the sale of marijuana to people who can demonstrate that they may benefit from its avowed medicinal properties. Matt Cook, a former narcotics officer, wrote the law and served as the state's first director of enforcement. If you'll note video security cameras in the system, uh, and the, and the reason for that? There is. Uh, we created a very transparent uh, regulatory scheme uh, and wanted to ensure that what they said they were doing, they were actually doing. 170 plants. No state has gone to the lengths to manage medical marijuana that Colorado has. Every licensed dispensary must grow at least 70% of its own product indoors, so harvesting and sales can be closely monitored. This crop is worth about a quarter of a million dollars. We track everything from seed to sale, uh, and they have to account for 100% of it. Um, we've got a gentleman here that uh, has a, a live, if you will, software program that does all of the tracking for this commodity. Each plant has a barcode and is registered to a specific patient. Most dispensaries will cultivate a couple of dozen different strains, some of them proprietary, like ales at a microbrewery engineered to have particular characteristics, as our bud tender Kerry explained. This is called uh, Jack Frost, but it's a triple A, alert, awake, and aware. If you needed to medicate in the AM before going to work, no one would ever be able to detect that you took any medicine, just as you would any other medicines that you take. Um, so no physical lethargy is my point. But we should point out that those properties are anecdotal and not based on studies by either the FDA or the DEA, a subject we will get to shortly. There is also no correlation between the more popular brand names and the ailments they alleviate. Dopium is a medication available at Denver Relief, owned by Ian Seed. It's gotten high marks from critics. Yes, there are medical marijuana critics in Colorado, even competitions. You won the Colorado Medical Marijuana Harvest Cup? We did. A couple of years ago? Yeah, in 2009. And our biodiesel won five out of the six categories in first place, so we won the overall award. It was a, a sweeping victory, if you will. And biodiesel? Really, yeah. That's biodiesel. the name of it? Yes, it is. And Does it, it sound it, like it, medicine? It, there's a lot of strains out there that don't sound like medicine because this didn't used to be legal, and those strain names have not changed. You know, strains back in the 70s, you know, there was Afghani, and we still have AK-47 that came from the Hindu Kush region of Afghanistan originally. But it's not all brand loyalty and nostalgia. There are lots of new things on the dispensary shelf, especially for non-smokers. They're called edibles, the marriage of botanical science and the culinary arts. Marijuana-infused cookies, candy, chocolate truffles, even olive oil. 
And for patients watching their waistline, there are marijuana pills that come in different strengths, just like Tylenol and Advil. You simply take it with a glass of water and it puts you where you need to be. The people who have invested money in all of this are known locally as ganjapreneurs. Colorado has had a history of gold rushes and silver rushes, and some people have dubbed this the green rush, not just for the color of medical marijuana, but for the money that might eventually be made here if you're among the first to stake a claim. Christy Kelly was doing marketing in Washington when she decided to invest in a medical marijuana dispensary. There's not a lot of opportunities in any one lifetime where you can be a part of something from such an early stage. And so ultimately my partners begged me to come out and my husband and I packed up our bags and um, shut down our life in D.C. and moved out here. The company's evolution has been fairly dynamic. Trip Kieber is CEO of Dixie Elixirs, the leading manufacturer of cannabis-laced edibles. It supplies most of the state's 537 dispensaries from this factory, which he calls state-of-the-art for the industry, which means small scale. So here we have uh, Lexi, who is one of our production specialists. Uh, she's preparing um, our medicated chocolate rolls, which are uh, certainly one of our most popular edibles products. Uh, it smells really good. It looks yeah. good. <laughs> Dixie Elixir product line includes ice creams and medicated beverages that come in 10 different flavors. We have a 75 milligram, 12 ounce sparkling red currant, would be the equivalent of four or five doses of medicine for a patient. What would happen to me if I drank one of these? Uh, you would have a very long but mellow afternoon. <laughs> Kieber and his partners have poured a million dollars into this business and have also pioneered edible products in capsules they say contain all the medicinal benefits of marijuana, but without the high. What's your business plan? So our plan, um, uh, you know, and I'm having... Long term and short term. Sure, the, the long term uh, plan for this business, for Dixie Elixirs and Edibles, as I've never been really shy to share, is, is ultimately to sell it. I truly believe that whether it's big alcohol, big tobacco, or big pharma, um, a company uh, like one of those is going to look very, very closely at medical cannabis. It's about a $2 billion market in 2012, growing to just under $9 billion in 2016. So you're seeing hockey stick growth, and I think companies like Dixie are well positioned to be acquired as the uh, industry develops. It's a risky proposition. The industry requires a big capital investment, and the medical marijuana marketplace is already saturated. But Matt Cook, who wrote the rule book for all of this and is now a consultant to the medical marijuana industry, says it's helped pull Denver out of the recession, occupying once vacant retail and industrial space, providing thousands of jobs and new revenue for the state of Colorado. What's the economic impact been? It's huge. There's over a million square feet of lease space mm -hmm. in the Denver area. Uh, look at all the electrical contractors the HVAC contractors, a uh, number of ancillary businesses. It's huge. Um, tax revenues exceeded, I believe the last number I heard was in excess of $20 million. In spite of all the euphoria, there is a cloud hanging over the cannabis industry in Colorado, and it's not marijuana smoke. It's the Federal Controlled Substances Act, which still lists marijuana as a Schedule I drug, every bit as dangerous as heroin, with no medical benefit. And the Justice Department is not happy with the wide-scale commercialization of Colorado cannabis. Sam Kamen is a law professor at the University of Denver and one of the reigning experts on the subject. In Colorado, you can grow it if you're licensed and you can sell it um, if you're licensed to people who have a card to buy it. Yes, but... And all of those people are violating federal law. Exactly, and that's the really strange thing is that we have this, you know, sort of hundreds of dispensaries servicing as many as 100,000 people, and every transaction that occurs is a federal crime, and every, all the manufacturing of the product, from the growing of it to the, the uh, making of the products and, and everything else, all of those are serious federal crimes, too. Even though the state of Colorado has passed a constitutional amendment, amendment allowing it. Exactly. It. Exactly. Right? The federal government sees it as a serious crime. They say, we know that California and 16 other states, the District of Columbia, we know you guys think it's medicine. It's not. We hear that you want to legalize it. You can't. We can't make you undo your statutes, but we can sure come in and prosecute your citizens that are violating federal law. But they haven't. But they haven't. 
And there's a reason for that. Some might call it the triumph of the marketplace. The federal government doesn't have enough manpower to shut down the medical marijuana business in Colorado or prosecute all the purveyors and patients, and the voters don't want it. Boulder County District Attorney Stan Garnett says it's virtually impossible to impanel a jury on a marijuana case here, let alone get a conviction. But what we deal with is what prosecutors call jury nullification, where juries say, I know what the law is, but I'm not going to follow it. This community has made it very clear that criminal enforcement of marijuana is not something they want me to spend any time on. Is it really an issue here? It's really not an issue. And that is more or less the position of the Justice Department in Washington. Deputy Attorney General James Cole has told U.S. attorneys not to waste resources prosecuting patients or caregivers that are in clear compliance with state medical marijuana laws. Our focus is really on keeping it away from children. Our focus is keeping it out of the hands of organized crime. Our focus is making sure that people aren't through marijuana dispensaries, using it as a pretext to do large-scale inter interstate drug dealing. These are the areas where we're really trying to focus. So the message is, if you're licensed in the state of Colorado and you follow the law, then you should be OK. Each case is going to rise and fall on its own unique facts. Any of that is still in violation of the Controlled Substance Act, of the federal law. We're not interested in bothering people who are sick and are using it in the recommendation of a doctor. We are concerned with people who are using it as a pretext to become large-scale drug dealers. It sounds like the federal government is tolerating it. It is tolerating it and at the same time is below the surface trying to make it very difficult for these folks. Uh, it's doing it through banking regulations. If, if you talk to dispensary owners, one of the things that they will lament is no one will do business with us. The Justice Department has let it be known that if financial institutions do business with medical marijuana centers, they could be at risk for civil or criminal prosecution under the Controlled Substances Act or federal money laundering statutes. It's made it difficult, if not impossible, for dispensaries to get loans, open company bank accounts, or process patients' credit cards. It can't stay like this. Either we have to have settled expectations that this is a federal crime, the federal government's not going to tolerate it, or the federal government is going to let states like Colorado regulate it, tax it, experiment with it. To have it exist in both worlds simultaneously is unsustainable. We can't have a multi-million dollar industry built on criminal conduct. A federal appeals court in Washington, D.C. is currently hearing a case that could remove marijuana from the list of the most dangerous drugs and into a category that would allow it to be prescribed by doctors. On the political front, the referendums in Colorado and Washington State to legalize marijuana for recreational use are considered too close to call.